In 1945, at the Altoona test plant, they hooked Q2 number 6175 to the dynamometer because the Pennsylvania Railroad wanted to know exactly what this machine could do when you open the throttle all the way and let the physics take over. The engineers watched the needle climb past numbers they had seen before on other locomotives, and it kept climbing until it finally settled on a figure that no steam locomotive anywhere in the world had ever reached on a test stand. That was record power. 7,987 indicated horsepower at 57.4 miles per hour, cylinder power, not drawbar. No higher measured figure has ever been documented before diesel power ended the era. The dynamometer does not lie about these things, and when you are measuring how much mechanical power those cylinders can produce from burning coal, the instruments tell you exactly what you are getting, regardless of what the marketing department wants to claim. Pennsylvania had been chasing more power for years because they needed to move heavier freight faster without double-heading everything in sight and paying two crews to do work that one locomotive should be able to handle on its own. Back in 1942, they built the Q1, which was a strange 4644 duplex arrangement. The rear cylinders sat behind the driving wheels instead of in front where 100 years of locomotive engineering said they belonged. Those rear cylinders ended up right next to the firebox where everything was hot and dirty, and the whole setup limited how large you could make the firebox in the first place. Locomotive number 6130 spent more time in the maintenance shops than it did out on the railroad earning its keep. Over seven years of service, it only managed to rack up about 165,000 miles before they gave up on the whole concept and sent it to the scrapyard in 1952. The engineers at Altoona went back and redesigned the whole thing as a 4464 wheel arrangement, which put all the cylinders up front where they could get clean air and where the maintenance crews could actually work on them without burning themselves on firebox heat every time something needed adjustment. When the prototype number 6131 rolled out of the shops in 1944, it came with streamlined casing that looked like something from the future, with all those smooth Art Deco curves and carefully sculpted sheet metal. The railroad followed up with 25 production units in 1945. They were numbered from 6175 to 6199, and the specifications on these machines were genuinely extraordinary, even by the standards of late-era steam power. The Q2 delivered roughly 114,000 to 115,000 pounds of starting tractive effort, including its booster, the highest documented figure for any rigid frame steam locomotive. The prototype cost $428,598 to build in 1944 dollars, and Pennsylvania's marketing people claimed the Q2 was 78% more powerful than anything the railroad currently had in service. They said it could haul 125 freight cars at a sustained speed of 50 miles per hour without any trouble, and the test plant numbers at least confirmed that this locomotive could produce power levels no rigid frame steam locomotive had ever reached before. Pennsylvania already had those J1-class locomotives, which were 2104 locomotives based on a Chesapeake and Ohio design, because wartime restrictions during World War II meant you could not develop completely new locomotive designs from scratch. The railroad built 125 of these J1 locomotives between 1942 and 1944, and they were solid, reliable workhorses that produced 95,000 pounds of tractive effort, with another 15,000 available from the booster for a total of 110,000 pounds. These locomotives did the work they were designed to do without excessive drama and without maintenance problems that make railroad managers start questioning whether the extra performance is worth the extra cost. On paper, the Q2 looked like it should replace the J1 across the entire system because it had more tractive effort and that record-breaking power on top of it, which should have made it the new standard for heavy freight operations on the Pennsylvania Railroad. The reality proved more complicated than the paper specification suggested, and those complications involved dieselization, maintenance costs that were not documented with specific dollar figures, and a 50 miles per hour speed limit on freight trains that sources say may have limited how much advantage the Q2 locomotives could actually use in regular service. The available information suggests that under Pennsylvania's 50 miles per hour limit, the Q2 locomotives may not have been significantly more capable than the conventional J1 locomotives in actual operation, 
and sources report they cost more to operate and maintain without providing exact cost comparisons. When diesel-electric units started arriving in serious numbers, the Q2 locomotives became early candidates for retirement. You will not find detailed financial records explaining exactly why, and if such records ever existed in detail, they have not surfaced publicly. Every single one of the 26 Q2 locomotives was out of service by 1951. That was only six years after the production units entered service, and seven years after the prototype first rolled out of the Altoona shops. The J-1 stayed in service into the late 1950s, with Pennsylvania's last regular steam freight runs ending in November 1957. That means those conventional locomotives outlasted the technologically advanced duplex design by six years. Sometimes older technology works better in practice than newer designs that look impressive on paper, but run into problems when real-world economics and day-to-day -day operational costs enter the picture. By 1956, the railroad had scrapped all 26 Q2s without preserving a single example. You have to figure they had their reasons for that decision, even if it looks short-sighted now from a preservation standpoint. The class is completely extinct, with zero survivors anywhere. What remains are two Q2 relics, number plate 6194 and builder's plate 6179, plus plate 6130 from the earlier Q1 design that somebody saved before the cutting torches erased the entire class. That tells you something about how the railroad felt about these machines by the end, because despite all the record-breaking power and impressive specifications, something apparently went wrong between the test plant and actual revenue service that made them more trouble than they were worth. The pattern becomes clear when you see a whole class retired after six years, while their predecessors continue working for another six beyond that, even without exact maintenance cost figures to point to. You will find forum posts and discussion threads where people claim all kinds of things about boiler failures and expensive overhauls, but none of that can be verified against actual Pennsylvania Railroad maintenance records or engineering reports. Those stories might be accurate history, or they might be rail fan mythology that grew more dramatic with each retelling. What can be verified is that 7,987 horsepower was absolutely real, measured at Altoona on a test stand that had been validating locomotive performance for decades and knew exactly how to quantify mechanical output from steam cylinders under controlled conditions. That number represents the absolute peak of what steam locomotive technology achieved in terms of measured power output before diesel-electric took over the industry, and nobody ever exceeded it because the transition to diesel happened before anyone built another steam locomotive that could challenge the record. The Q2 was the most powerful rigid frame steam locomotive ever constructed in terms of measured horsepower output. That is documented engineering fact from 1945, when number 6175 showed what a duplex drive 4464 could do when you push the design to its absolute limit. Six years later, they were all gone replaced by diesel units that apparently cost less to maintain and did not require the specialized expertise that complex steam power demanded from both operating crews and shop workers. That is the story of the Q2 in the end. The most powerful steam locomotive ever tested on a dynamometer, scrapped by 1956 with zero survivors, because measured power on a test stand does not always translate into economic success in actual railroad operations.